we need new narratives. We need new moral narratives, right? That articulate this shared purpose. We need to adjudicate the ends. This is what modern capitalism does. It doesn't allow us to adjudicate the ends. It says, no, it's just business. You're not allowed to question those ends, but we need to question those ends. Again, capitalism is a social construct. It's our responsibility to say, no, it's not just business. You are responsible. The system is responsible to us, and we are responsible to others. And through our responsibility to others, we are responsible for questioning what ends we should be going towards. And then we can build and articulate the means to get us to those ends. That is the point. This is hostile to the existing paradigm of the modern economic system. Welcome to Reviving Virtue, a podcast where we face the urgent challenges of today's world by exploring the crucial role of uncovering, together, a coherent moral narrative for our time. I'm your host, Jeffrey Anthony, on a quest to tackle liberalism's quandary and pave the way towards a more unified society. Join me on this journey as we delve into ethics, philosophy, and community building, seeking to create a common understanding that fosters human flourishing and harmony. Welcome to Reviving Virtue. Hello, Reviving Virtue listeners. I'm going to do a little talk about American pragmatism and Emerson. I've been reading some Emerson and, and kind of wrestling with his ideas. I want to focus on the idea of individualism and Emerson's idea of individualism. So I'm just going to jump right into this. So I came to American pragmatism a few years ago, and I see the construction of this only true American philosophy as a key to unlocking the ever-growing divide between the left and the right in America. And starting the process of reintegrating, or I should say, to recognition and reconciliation of our profound differences between this left-right dichotomy. I don't think anyone listening to this is unaware of how bifurcated our society has become. And I see this as an intentional project by certain forces in America. But I believe that we need to start articulating a new way of bringing control back to us. And a big part of that is the dialogue the words, the vocabulary we use. Now, my podcast, Reviving Virtue, is a project I started to explore in real time with you, this process of reintegration, of recognition, of the process of articulation of a new and potentially profound way of relating to each other. I chose to build this project on the ideas of virtues, as virtues are practices, and practices are active material processes that are done in community and also within. It is also a process of deep personal reflection, right? But a reflection that encompasses the world you are embedded within. It is this embeddedness, this sociality, which gives virtues their legibility or not, right? And ultimately their import to our society, our community. So I see the space of virtues and morals as being occupied by those that would be categorized in our modern categorization schema as capital R, right, the right. And I believe it is critical that the left, with a capital L, be part of this space and to provide constructive articulations in this field of virtues, morals, and ethics, but particularly virtues. So now one of the more corrosive elements of modernity, especially here in America, where this podcast is exclusively focused on for now, is the idea of individualism and hyper-individualism. I spent this week working through this concept of individualism. And it started with me exploring an old Dr. Cornell West book from 1989 called The American Invasion of Philosophy. And I specifically focused on the very first chapter on Ralph Waldo Emerson and the Emersonian conception of the individual, right? When you think of Emerson, you think of self-reliance, the virtue of personal self-development of your individual character and the pursuit of a higher understanding through this process and how this is fundamentally different than this modern American version that we move through every day. And you can see this manifest out of Silicon Valley, right? The ethos of the techno-libertarianism. It's, it's also rooted in the classic liberalism that is the foundation of this country. Now, liberalism is a big topic these days, the attack upon it by the right. I got a book here for my viewers. You'll be able to see this book here by Patrick Deneen. Uh, regime change toward a post-liberal future. I'm actually rereading this. I have, I have some problems with this book, but I also think this book is very important. I see a very large opening, a very large opening for the left and the right, at least the right that Patrick Deneen is articulating here. And he is speaking for 
this is what he claims, for, you know, flyover country. He uses that term because he's using it to show how the left or leftists use that as a derogatory term. But the flyover country is the heart of America. The people who don't live in major American cities, who occupy small to medium sized towns, and who comprise the, you know, the fabric of our society here outside of the cultural centers that you see in large metropolises. Now, the other, you can see other critiques of this, but not, maybe not so much a critique, but a warning from a very famous Harvard professor, Michael Sandel, his book, The Tyranny of Merit, what's become of the common good. Common good is very important. And this deals with meritocracy and the professionalization of politics and the professionalization seen through science, scientism, you could even say, and how this alienates the common understandings that we have of our society and this bifurcates. It's one of the, it's one of the vectors through which this bifurcation is happening. And this is what I'm trying to explore with my podcast. This is my grand overarching theme. And I want to use virtues as the way to get into this and how we need to reintegrate virtues from a left perspective. I, I just don't see it anywhere. Maybe, you know, please write into me. If you're listening to this and you're like, there's a whole wealth of intellectual writings on the virtues from a left perspective and how we can reintegrate that into our society, please let me know. I want to read it. I've been looking. I actually have a couple books back here and I have a couple people lined up to interview over the next two months that write about this, but not specifically from that lens, but they are from a non, you can say conservative, American conservative side, which seems to be the bulk of the writing on this. And classic liberalism is the articulations of John Locke. And I'm going to do an episode on John Locke at some point because it's very important to understand him. But this, the, the Lockean individualism is all about, it's instrumental reason. It's the concept of markets of the rational agent in markets. But so I don't want to go on a, too much of a tangent here. I want to begin by looking at what Cornell West portrays as the Emersonian theodicy, right? So in the American invasion of philosophy, if we look at Cornell West's conception of Emerson's theodicy in the American invasion of philosophy, it will provide the context for what's about to follow. So West emphasizes a profound intertwining of individual and communal virtues. For Emerson, the pursuit of truth and self-realization is not an isolated endeavor, but one deeply connected to the moral and social fabric of society. This Emersonian theodicy champions a vision of humanity where individuals, by cultivating personal integrity and the wisdom that goes along with that process, contribute to our harmonious and virtuous community. Now, there's a lot in there. That's, there's a lot of work going on in that one sentence, and I hope to unpack part of it in this episode. So in this framing, self-reliance transcends mere self-interest, right, the Lockean idea, to embody a democratic ethos that recognizes the integral role of each individual within the larger social whole. The path to personal enlightenment becomes a path to social cohesion and mutual respect, respect, responsibility, right? So reflecting a practical vision of democracy enshrined by personal growth and collective virtue. Now, this is not like the idea of the individual rational agents being mediated through market transactions, which is premised on instrumental rationality, which we focus on in the very first interview I did on this podcast, in extractive founding. But quite the opposite, this framing, the Emersonian framing, that is, is one rooted upon generative poesis that enriches and nurtures social relationships over the pursuit of individualistic power. It's more of a power with, we want to use a Brene Brownism. So this Emersonian uh, theodicy, as elucidated by Cornel West, is anchored in three fundamental premises that form the core of Emerson's thought. First, it asserts an optimistic belief in the inherent goodness and potential of the individual. Now, this is the opposite of a Burkean conception of the individual. We haven't talked about Burke yet, but this is important. I just wanted to point that out. And I will say that in, I'm, I'm going off script here, but that Patrick Deneen and Regine Change is a big fan of Burke. And I think we need to wrestle with what Burke is trying to say. And I need to wrestle with this because I have not read Burke's work directly. I've read a lot about it through all of those. It's through a bunch of other books, especially the economist Albert Hirschman. Albert Hirschman spends quite a bit of time focusing on Burke and his influence on modern society. He thinks corrosive influence. So then, I'll just start, I'll say this again. First, it asserts an optimistic belief in the inherent goodness of the potential of the individual. 
emphasizing the capacity for self-improvement and spiritual growth. Second, it champions a moralistic approach that sees personal virtue and ethical integrity as essential to individual fulfillment and societal harm. This moral perspective transcends mere rules and regulations, focusing instead on an inner cultivation of values that guide behavior. Third, the theodicy is activistic, right? Urging individuals not to merely just sit back and contemplate the ideals, but to actively engage with the world, to transform themselves and their communities through action, right? Not just sitting around thinking about it. Together, these premises create a rich and compelling vision of human existence, where individual enlightenment and societal well-being are deeply interconnected, reflecting a living democracy that adapts to the needs and values of its people for its time. This is a continually evolving process. I'm going to jump again over here to Patrick Deneen because he is adamantly against this conception of progress in this book. I think he's he I think that's a, a big failure, to be honest with you. I think that the left's current conception of progress at all costs is a big problem. And I think Deneen's community and traditions at all costs and with the idea that we have the agency to create and to actively engage with our current moment in time. We are in time. His is radical. I, I think Deneen's is radical in our contemporary modern culture. I also think the left's, and it's not only the left, it is, it's uh, the classic liberalism that, which encompasses conservatives. He will say they don't count as conservatives. But, you know, you can say that center, center right, center left, this whole idea of everything progresses and we must always progress and that technology will progress us and we'll fix and that we just plow ahead. I think that's bad. This is why I started this podcast. I used to be the person that would say that. But this idea of reflecting a living democracy, it's a living democracy that adapts to the needs and values of its people in time is very important. So I want to do a quick definition of terms here before I go any further. In traditional religious context, the term theodicy refers, and I'll spell it for you, T-H-E-O-D-I-C-Y, refers to a philosophical attempt to reconcile the existence of evil with a benevolent God. It's a way of grappling with the profound questions of why suffering exists in a world governed by a loving de deity, right? Why is there, why is there, why does, why do people suffer when we have an all-loving God, right? However, when we talk about Emersonian's theodicy, as interpreted through Cornell West, we're using the term in a different sense. So Emerson's theodicy doesn't deal with divine beings or the problem of evil per se. Instead, it's a philosophical vision that seeks to reconcile the individual's pursuit of personal virtue and self-realization with the well-being of the community, right? It's this dialectic between the two. It's a framework that sees the cultivation of personal integrity and moral wisdom as essential to building a harmonious and virtuous society. This stands in stark contrast to the other modern conceptions that we've already talked about. I want to move ahead. Now, I spent the week, this week, I wrote something this week, and that's, I'm essentially going to read what I wrote with interjections. I wrote up an essay on this Emersonian pursuit of virtue through the individual and then through the community, right? And I posted this on my Substack, and I actually started a Medium page as well. I believe that Medium and Substack draw in different readers. So the Emersonian theodicy advocates for the idea that each individual's pursuit of truth and self-realization is not an isolated or solitary endeavor, but is deeply interconnected with the well-being of the community as a whole. Now, by cultivating personal virtue, wisdoms, and moral integrity, Individuals become not just self-sufficient entities, but valuable contributors to the collective good. The development of individual character and the pursuit of higher understanding have societal implications, big ones, as individuals strive to connect with the divine or universal essence rooted in the eminence of public life and not unmoored in transcendent atemporal time. They also develop a heightened sense of empathy, social responsibility, and ethical commitment to others. The cultivation of inner wisdom translates into an enlightened engagement with the community, contributing to a harmonious and virtuous society, we hope. A democracy that is enriched by personal growth and collective virtue is not some utopian ideal. I'm not a utopian. It is a practical vision for a society that honors both the uniqueness of each, and each person and the shared values that bind us. 
we need to uncover those shared values. This is part of the process, right? So in a creative democracy, which is what I'm trying to envision here, a democracy which is creative and active, the path to social cohesion and mutual respect, in Emerson's view, true self-reliance is not selfish. It's not self-centered. No, it encourages individuals to recognize their integral role within the larger social fabric. The development of authentic selfhood becomes a path to social cohesion, mutual respect, and communal flourishing, we hope. This stands in contrast to the Lockean individualism, where the emphasis is on personal rights and self-interest, right? The instrumentalization of and objectification of your neighbor, which submerges your responsibility and your ultimate accountability to your neighbor when you put everything within the market framing. It's just business. What does that do? That objectifies the people you engage with. They're no longer humans, subjects. They're objects through which you realize your personal needs. This is a major problem. This is what I'm trying to articulate here through this Emersonian theodicy. So the Emersonian approach to democracy, his philosophy presents a vision of democracy that transcends mere politics and governance. So it seeks to infuse democratic principles into every aspect of our lives through a practice, through virtue, right? Creating a society where each individual's moral and intellectual growth contributes to the collective well-being. In this framework, personal transformation is not an isolated quest. It is deeply tied to social responsibility, community development, and the promotion of democratic virtues. Now, pragmatism and the public sphere, like, so Emerson thought pragmatism, he didn't think pragmatism because that didn't exist when Emerson was around. Cornel West is claiming that Emerson is the OG pragmatist, and it was Dewey, James, and Pierce, but mostly Dewey was wrestling with the, uh, and James was wrestling with the ideas of Emerson and bringing those into modernity, into the ideas of pragmatism in their writings, especially Dewey. So offers a philosophical approach that emphasizes the practical applications of intelligence. Now, intelligence is not a description, it's a method, okay, to resolve societal issues. By acknowledging the complex interplay between the individual and society, pragmatism aims to foster an inclusive, dynamic and adaptive community that can respond creatively and intelligently to the challenges of modern life. This is where I have a problem with Patrick Deneen's whole framing, where he emphasizes tradition, the common sense, as he'll say, is more important than anything, right? At least that's how I read him. Maybe he'll disagree. If you're, if you're a Patrick Deneen fan and disagree with me, let me know. Please write in my emails in the show notes. Now, the reason why I like Dewey pragmatic conception is that it, it actually brings in the idea of traditions and community, but realizes that we're moving through time and that as we move through time, we can creatively and intelligently use what we know today with the traditions that we have and engage with them and produce new articulations to settle the problems we have today. We will always have problems. I, there is no utopia. This is why I'm saying I'm not utopia. We will never get to a point where all problems are solved. That just won't happen. That's not how I believe. I mean, I know there's other philosophers who will disagree. But I, I totally disagree with that. This is why I like pragmatism, because it acknowledges that reality. Some of the challenges and misunderstandings are that the promise of Emersonians creative democracy, it has often been a misunderstood or mischaracterized, especially by those who equate individualism with self-interest or isolationism. The nuance between the nuanced balance between personal integrity and social commitment requires careful thought and deliberate practice, leading to potential misconceptions and resistance from various political perspectives. If we return from Emerson's original insight and by recognizing the inherent value in the creative interplay, it's active between the individual and community, we may find a more harmonious path. I'm not saying we may, we will. Democracy enriched by personal growth and collective virtue so it is a practical vision for a society that honors both the uniqueness of each individual and the shared values that bind us together. Now, if we want to rearticulate the Emersonian ethos, the Emersonian theodicy enlarges a person's relationship with the community by fostering a philosophy of life that is both individual and profoundly social. I love this idea of enlarging, right? This type of orientation to the self and the world enlarges your participation in the world. It is grounded in an individual's responsibility. I love that. It's just responsibility. This is something we do not 
value in modern American society. Responsibility is not a word that we articulate. It's not a virtue that is practiced in modern America. In fact, responsibility is something that is submerged. It's submerged in the economic rationale that articulates our society, right? The phrase, it's just business, right? That is saying, I am not responsible to you. It's just business. I just readjusted my mic there for a moment. So it changed a little bit. So the, this idea of it's just business that removes your agency that I associate with your responsibility as a member of a society. You know, this is why neoliberalism is so popular and it's been so durability is really founded upon this idea of a lack of responsibility to the other, to society. And when you question it, built within the order of neoliberalism is this idea of how dare you question it, right? Because through the questioning, we're saying, but you are responsible, right? You do have this responsibility to your neighbor, to your community, to the global world, to the environment. This is why I'm a big fan of this pragmatism, but, but I'm a big fan of the Emersonian theodicy. How do we reintegrate the virtues of self-discovery and making yourself, of working on yourself and how that process is tied with the process of engaging with community, not in an instrumental objectifying manner, but in one that is in a enriching, one that is in a generative, one that says my improvement on myself and how I engage in the world as an individual is better. It helps all of us go up. It's not an extractive version, right? And this is a big difference. Like when we look at Silicon Valley, like Silicon Valley, I, I lived there for 10 years and I worked at a startup that became a household name. And the whole ethos is the hustle culture. We're getting, we got to hustle, hustle. But through this hustling, we submerge all of our relations with the people that are outside of this internal little bubble that we're doing. And they tell these narratives. They, you know, have you ever noticed that like you get these communique from these startups? The community is so important to us. Like, please respond to us and give us feedback and to make our community richer. Like they create these internal bubbles of community, which are completely, and it creates this false myth, this narrative that they're, that what they're doing is actually enriching the community. But in reality, they're submerging the importance of the responsibility that you have to your community because the vast majority of these businesses out of Silicon Valley are extractive. They exist to extract from individuals, from communities, from cities, from states, from nations, and suck it in to a very small bubble of people on the inside who have claims on the actual businesses through stock, right, and other sorts of financial claims. But those are the people they, you know, just think, look at Uber, like Uber is a perfect example. They said, we're making the world better by offering this, this service that's better than cabs and it's blah, blah, blah. But what has it done? It's created a system in which uh, drivers are exploited. It then helps out other capitalists, helps out other firms that pay below a living wage. And then they say, but they have the freedom to go work for Uber at night, right? I mean, that's insane. What? That's, not a, that's not a way of engaging with community responsibly. That is an extractive community bifurcating orientation to the world. It destroys communities, but then they think that they are, are making the world better, but they're not, right? And if you are to say your responsibility to community is more important than you making a higher return on your invested capital, and then that the response is, how dare you? How dare you? Because you are saying that you are responsible, right? You're implying that individuals through their job are responsible. So let me just, re let me start from the top of this section again, because I got on a long tangent there. The rearticulation of the Emersonian ethos thus is that the Emersonian theodicy enlarges, right? The person's relationship with the community by fostering a philosophy of life that is both deeply individualistic and profoundly social. It is grounded in the individual's responsibility to the larger social fabric through the productive engagement with the self. It invites people to see themselves as integral parts of a greater whole, where personal growth and self-discovery contribute to the collective well-being, moral development, and democratic ideals of the community. In doing so, it provides an antidote to instrumental reason, which can objectify one's neighbor and remove the essential bonds that enables communities to flourish. 
pragmatism as a philosophy, it emphasizes the importance of practical consequences and experiential learning. It values the adaptability of, and flexibility required to meet the ever-changing demands of human existence, which is what I've been talking about, right? So in its rejection of fixed abstract principles and its embrace of dynamic lived experience, right? Pragmatism complements the Emersonian pursuit of a creative democracy that adapts to the needs and values of the community. Uh, there is a, one of these books I read, like when they say, what is pragmatism kind of when it comes to what is a truth? Because pragmatism has a very d specific idea of truth that really scares people. But they might say, here's this truth, X equals Y. And a pragmatist will say, what, what can this truth do for me now? That's a way of coming at a truth. What can it do for me? Like, how does this truth actually impact not only my life, but our lives? I and mean, if it's not legible, if it doesn't make any sort of sense to our current state in life, then what good is that truth that you're calling a truth? You know, what good is that if it's no good for our society? Notably, pragmatism sees ideas and beliefs not as abstract entities, but as tools. I love that. To navigate and engage with the world. They're tools, right? This approach aligns with the Emersonian project of grounding the spiritual and moral development of the individual in the concrete realities of social life. For both Emerson and pragmatists, the individual's growth and realization of potential and inseparably tied to the broader community and the material conditions of existence. Understanding and transforming the self cannot be separated from understanding and transforming the social fabric. It's impossible to do those in isolation. In today's political landscape, marked by polarization, fragmentation, and a lack of dialogue, the synthesis of an Emersonian theodicy and pragmatisms offers, in my opinion, a way forward. So it emphasizes, by emphasizing the deep interconnection between personal development and communal well-being, this philosophy orientation encourages us to look beyond narrow self-interests and divisive ideologies, and it urges us to see the inherent dignity and worth in each other and recognize that our flourishing is dependent upon your flourishing. Through a commitment to ongoing dialogue, mutual respect, and shared ethical values, now this takes a lot of work, right? It, will, it can provide a framework for addressing our political impasse. It teaches us that the path to a more harmonious society lies not in retreating into our isolated little antagonistic camps, by it, but in cultivating a sense of shared purpose. We need new narratives. We need new moral narratives, right, that articulate this shared purpose. We need to adjudicate the ends. This is what modern capitalism does. It doesn't allow us to adjudicate the ends. It says, no, it's just business. You're not allowed to question those ends, but we need to question those ends. Again, capitalism is a social construct. It's our responsibility to say, no, it's not just business. You are responsible. The system is responsible to us, and we are responsible to others. And through our responsibility to others, we are responsible for questioning what ends we should be going towards. And then we can build and articulate the means to get us to those ends. That is the point. This is hostile to the existing paradigm of the modern economic system. You are meant to feel uncomfortable with questioning the ends. That is how neoliberalism is so durable, because it shames you. How dare you question? No, it's your responsibility to question, and it's all of our responsibilities to ensure that those questions get heard and that we work together productively to articulate a new system that works for us that will get us to the ends we come to through dialogue and through enlarging our vocabulary and our narratives to include more and to work productively together to create a more compassionate and flourishing society, right? So I wanna end here by bringing us back to the virtues, right? So Emerson's Theodicy, and the philosophical underpinnings of American pragmatism remind us that the vital importance of virtues in our personal and collective lives, right? Th these are not abstract, disconnected ideals, but active material practices that shape who we are and how we relate to one another. They offer us a path toward not only self-improvement, but also societal harmony and progress. We hope, but we need to start working towards that. The virtues of self-reliance, integrity, empathy, and social responsibility, as articulated by Emerson and further developed by the pragmatists, especially through Dewey, stands as guiding principles that can help us navigate the complexities and challenges of our modern world. They invite us to see ourselves not in isolation, but as integral parts of a vibrant, dynamic community. Right. So by reviving and re-articulating these virtues, by reviving these virtues, 
we can begin to bridge the divide that has emerged in our political and social discourse. We can foster a culture that values not just individual success, but the well-being of all. Your individual success is directly tied to the well-being of all. In this way, the pursuit of virtues become not merely a personal endeavor, but a shared mission that resonates with our collective aspirations for a more just, compassionate, and flourishing society. Now, as we continue to explore these ideas in future episodes of Reviving Virtue, I invite you to reflect on how these virtues manifest in your own life and how they might guide our collective actions toward greater understanding. Together, I hope we can build a future that honors the inherent dignity and potential of each individual while nurturing the shared values and connections that make us a community. It takes work. It takes articulation. It takes a lot of work here. And so that's what I'm hoping to do going forward over these next couple years as I work through this with you. So please reach out if you have a book that you'd like me to read or a paper or a lecture that you want me to watch, please let me know. I, I'm trying to find more people who are on the left who are talking about this specific idea so that we can get in dialogue together, right? Well, thanks. We'll see you again next week. Um, be well.